Hello, and welcome back to At World's Edge, the fantasy lore podcast. In this chapter of Atlas of the Old World, we will be journeying deep into the Empire of Man to the ancient and evil Brass Keep. Appearing on maps of the Warhammer world for years, this mysterious locale has been a source of inspiration for role-playing, tabletop, and computer games alike. Today, we will be taking a look at the history, geography, and general importance of this area, so that you as a gamer can better understand this strange and characterful environ for your own games. Deep within the Empire, rising from the never-ending forests of that land, adjacent to the great plateau of Middenheim, the Fauschlag, stand the Middle Mountains. Appearing strangely apart from the fault line mountain ranges of the Gray, Black, and World's Edge Mountains, the Middle Mountains are at the intersection of five imperial provinces, but tamed by none. It is within this mountain range that the ancient cursed structure known as the Brass Keep exists. The geography of the Middle Mountains has informed its history, much of which has been bloody. Without giving a full accounting of that region, which deserves its own video, this solitary mountain range first came into history as a location of a third and non-polar chaos gate, a sibling to those which were found at the poles of Malus and which caused the Great Cataclysm with their collapse. It is to this gate that the Slayer Brotherhood of Grimnir believes that their progenitor, the ancestor god Grimnir himself, journeyed to at the end of his life, and which he sacrificed himself to hold closed. Whether or not this is true, there is doubtless a nexus of chaos energy which permeates the area and expresses itself through even miles of stone. This assertion is, is supported additionally, as we know there will be arcane, universe-ending technology under, uncovered underneath the Fauschlag, the southern spur of the range during the end times, which is intimately connected to the realm of chaos. The mountains themselves are largely devoid of mineral wealth of any kind which one would expect to be present at a major fault line location, and neither the flora nor, fa nor fauna thrive in its environs. The economic viability of the Middle Mountains more generally, and the Brass Keep specifically, is dubious. The dwarves could not find expected mineral deposits, and the iron seams are only viable if mined by free prison labor. Inhabitants of the Keep have historically been dependent on imported food from the neighboring communities, with farming and foraging both limited. Native wildlife seems to be greenskins, trolls, and various non-monstrous creatures twisted by chaos, which similarly make unappetizing meals. The Brass Keep sits on the southern facing of the, of the Middle Mountains, nestled within a few days' march of Middenheim, within a great valley or crater filled with water. In the distant past, in the first records of the dwarves of that region, there was a great fortress here, akin to those of, that the Assyr of Althuan built upon the foundation of perfectly cut stone in the way that only dwarf craftsmen could achieve. In the years before the War of Vengeance, such structures were not uncommon, with Toralesi famously a perfect melange of dwarven skill and elven aesthetic. Strangely, though, there is no record of a fortress being built here, either in the records of the Phoenix Court or of the Karazhan Corps. As a theory, based on the information we have, but not fully confirmed by, by lore, I believe that the fortress was likely one built by the Grey Lords, those elven mages cast out of Ulthuan after the Sundering, who refused to give up their sorcerous ways, but, to, to, but who did not consider themselves followers of Malekith. They sought to create a vision of their world of their world that mirrored their homeland, and in this region, specifically Lorelorn to the south, the dwarves would have a nearby would have had no issue selling their services to the elves at this time. So this would have also explained why, by the time Sigmar arrived thousands of years later, there was nothing but a single pearlescent tower rising from a dull ruined wall. As we know that when the elves depart a city, it begins to lose the luster that their magical animus sustains. This was noted by the dwarves as the elves retreated from their settlements during the War of Vengeance, and later by human settlers who inhabited the former ruins of the High Elves. It would also explain why there's no records of the settlement, as the Grey Lords were not monitored by the Phoenix Court, and the dwarves of the region were not in full communion with the High King of Karaza Karak. Regardless, the settlement was abandoned by the time the dwarves settling the area in nearby Karaz Kazarak found it. Though it was still splendid, sometime around 200 before the imperial calendar, the necromancer Moroth took up residence in the keep, using its reserves of magical power both to recreate a facsimile of his lost city of Morcane in the south, and to begin building a great and ever-expanding army of the dead from the communities of the surrounding mountains. When Sigmar arrived, the brass keep was composed of a single white tower surrounded by ruins, but sitting atop a fantastic magical recreation of an ancient city, an illusion to be sure but far, one far beyond the ken of primitive men. When the Emperor of Man threw down the necromancer, the illusions disappeared, and the fortress was soon claimed by the retreating forces of chaos led by Cormac Bloodaxe, fleeing their defeat in the south to the same emperor. 
As the Empire grew, the North was a constant battleground against northernly forces of chaos, and the Brass Keep became a strategic asset guarding the pass through the mountains that directly opposed Middenheim. It was the fortified continuously for centuries from when it was captured in 450 Imperial Calendar until the time of the Three Emperors in the 1880s. During this conflict, an Imperial Knight by the name of Mordek took command of the fortress and was co corrupted by its malign influence. Swearing himself to the Chaos Gods, he abandoned the fortress, and it was reclaimed by the Empire, who have held it up to the modern age, a strong bastion against the chaotic north and a beacon of imperial authority against the Middle Mountains. But what about using the Brass Keep in your own games? When it comes to tabletop wargames, the fortress is held by garrisons from nearby Middenheim. As it is a mountain fortress, the imperial forces there are likely to be a force composed of ranged fire, irregular mountain skirmishers, and artillery at the expense of large infantry blocks or cavalry. That said, the mountains are also bordered by four other electors, and their colors could be seen passing through those gates as well, especially as Middenheim and Talabakland are on opposing sides of the Imperial Civil War, which is when the Old World is set. Armies of dwarves seeking to recover treasures from the ruins of Karak Stig and Kazarak would also be reasonable to see. The area is infested with greenskins of all types and is a haunt of chaos in both human and bestial forms, so orcs and goblins, beastmen, and warriors of chaos could all be encountered here. If we are talking about roleplay, there are treasures abounding of the chaotic, undead, and dwarven variety throughout the area, and there is no reason that bands of adventurers would not be present. Similarly, the Brass Keep changes hands so frequently that infiltration-type scenarios would be well-placed. Regardless of the scale, the Enverons are of an aged and slightly run-down fortress, much like the Castle Black of Game of Thrones, and battles would either be in the courtyards and ramparts of the fortress, or a desperate route in the mountain passes approaching the keep. What are your thoughts on the Brass Keep? Do you agree with my theory surrounding its foundation? Do you have your own ideas? Put your thoughts in the comments below. With that, I thank you for taking the time to enjoy this video with me. The Atlas series are my favorite because of my love of maps, and I think that a highly specialized and personalized gaming board is just the most fun thing to play on. Please click like, share this video, and subscribe for more content, and I'll catch you in the future.